in everybody's lives, they have the family they are born into, and then they have the family that they choose. And I, for one, was an incredibly lucky person to have the family that I was born into be so incredibly supportive. When I was eight years old, I remember distinctively sitting on the couch watching the 1980 Lake Placid men's ice hockey team. And I think it's absolutely fantastic that the Winter Olympics are actually going on right now because it really brought that memory home to me these last couple of days watching the Olympics and seeing that eight-year-old girl that I was watching those games on the couch with my mom and dad. And I remember seeing Jim Craig literally spinning on his head um, and, and helping the Team USA beat the, the Soviet Union at the time. And I remember thinking and saying to myself out loud and my mom and dad, I want to be an Olympian after USA won that gold medal. I want to be an Olympian. That's so cool. And I remember my mom and dad both distinctively saying, you can. You can be an Olympian if it's what you want to be. You just got to go out there and work hard. You can have anything and be anything that you want to be. And as time went on, I became a little bit older and I played different sports. I didn't start playing soccer until I was 12 years old. I played a little uh, tackle football in there somewhere. Thank goodness that was a lot of fun. For two years in fourth and fifth grade, I remember playing uh, softball, running track. And when I was 12 years old, I remember sitting uh, on my bed one afternoon after school and thinking to myself, I wonder what Olympics would be the Olympics I could play in. What Olympics would be the right Olympics at the right time for me? So I remember sitting down think, think, thinking about this and distinctively saying, okay, so I'm 12 years old now. I think the, the first time I would be able to be in the Olympic Games would probably be 1996 in Atlanta. I didn't necessarily know what sport it would be. At the time, I thought it would probably be track. I definitely didn't think it would be ice hockey, obviously. But I remember sitting down on my bed and, and writing out a sign that said, Atlanta, 1996, I have a dream. And it was an eight by 10 piece of paper and I took that piece of paper and I stuck it on the wall in my bedroom. So every morning when I'd wake up, I'd look at it and see it and remember it and think about it. And then every night when I came home, before I went to bed, I would see that sign. And day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that sign was there. And I remember saying to my mom and dad, you know, as I grew up, this is what I want to do. I want to be an Olympian. And they said, yes, you can, honey. Yes, you can. I was really fortunate to be born into a family that was so incredibly supportive. And particularly my mom and dad were there with me every step of the way, every practice, every game, tournaments, local, across the country, every sport I ever played, they always said, yes, you can. Yes, you can play that. Yes, you can play basketball every single time. The only one time they said no was ice hockey, which is ironic, right? Because that's the one that inspired me the most. But that was the one they were like, oh, that's a little bit too dangerous. We don't think we like those sticks, that ice and those blades. So no to that, but yes to everything else. And I was grateful, internally grateful for them. And as I grew up, I started to play soccer a lot more full time and I got college scholarship opportunities to 70 different uh, scholarships on um, different schools around the country. Not just soccer, but also basketball, track and softball as well. And my parents were very, very keen on me staying local, but they also knew that there might be an opportunity for me to go elsewhere further away from them and they were willing to allow that to happen and they supported me in that and they loved me and they cherished me and they said you know what Brian you got to do what you got to do you make your decision and you choose which school is best for you which program suits you best and I ended up going to the University of Massachusetts and at the time the coach there was Jim Rudy and he knew Anson Dorrance and before I knew it I was on the national team after my senior year in college, I got called in for November training camp in 1993, and that was the very first training camp I ever had. And at that time, one of the coaches was Tony DeChico. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm not sure what they see in me, but I guess they must see something. And I know I really like it, the opportunity that I have here 
So whatever it is that they see, I'm just going to keep showing them that. And Tony said to me on my first exit meeting, after my first training camp, after I think I, I actually allowed over a thousand goals that week. Because <laughs> if anybody's ever gone from college to national team, you try to stop Tisha Venturini's shot, Michelle Akers, Karen Gabera, um, you know, Mia Hamm, all these amazing players that are all in the Hall of Fame now, by the way. Your first time at, age, at a young age in, in my early 20s. And I wasn't always so sure that particular week. I know I liked what I was doing, but I wasn't sure if they were going to invite me back. So I go into my exit meeting, and Tony says, hey, bro, come on in, have a seat. And I sit down, and he says to me, great job this week. And I look at him, I'm like, really? Are you sure? Are you joking? I must have given up 1,000 goals. He's like, no, you did fantastic. It wasn't about the goals that you gave up. It was about your attitude that you displayed afterwards. It was about the determination you had and the way you conducted yourself after goals were scored. You didn't allow one to end up being three, four, and five much of the time, maybe one, one more, maybe two, but that's it. So we're inviting you back in again. And I was on cloud nine on top of the world. And shortly after that, I remember going to Soccer Plus camp later that summer, that next summer, the next year, 1994, and there I went there with Jen Mead. Does anybody know who, remember who Jen Mead is? Anyone? No one? Well, she was one of the most amazing people. She was a fantastic goalkeeper, tall girl, about five foot 11, maybe, maybe six foot. Big girl, fantastic in the air, and just an amazing personality. And she and I both went to the Soccer Plus goalkeeper camp to work for Tony. And we were walking down the hallway right before the camp began, and one of the other um, coaching instructors walked by us and, and said hello. Now, at the time, I thought for sure that I had acknowledged that other coach, but apparently I hadn't, and later on I found out that she was not too happy with me and thought I was a stuck-up snob <laughs> for ignoring her and not saying hello. Well, little did I know that she would be someone who would be in my life for the next 25 years, and her name is Carrie Rifle. And Carrie and I have been friends for a very long time, and we went through that soccer camp um, together and got to be really good friends then and continued our relationship and being in each other's lives for many, many years to come after that. And then as I went on and I played for the national team in 1996, we had our first opportunity to play for Olympic gold medal. And as you all know, we did incredibly well, and it was a fantastic event, and I absolutely loved it because finally, Finally, that 12-year-old girl who made that sign that said, Atlanta, 1996, I have a dream, and that little 8-year-old girl who sat on that couch with her mom and dad and said, I want to be an Olympian, was actually standing on the soccer pitch from a place far, far away, Dayton, Minnesota, no one had ever heard of, and I was living the dream that I had at eight, and I was living the dream that I had at 12. And I was playing for my country on one of the most amazing teams to have ever existed in sport, not just men's and women's sports, but all sports. And I had this opportunity to play, and boy, did we play. We came in and we played China. We beat them in the final, as all of you know. And I finally achieved my Olympic dream. And it was outstanding. My parents were both in the stands, and they were so proud. And in 1996, thank you. Thank you. And in 1996, we became Olympic champions. And I remember that medal being put over my head and I had a flashback to watching the 1980 Olympic team get the medals put around their necks and over their heads. And I remember thinking to myself, boy, this thing is heavy. Wow, this is so heavy. This is awesome. And I just felt this amazing elation and relief that I had finally made it. After so many years of working 
and great support from my family, I had made it. And as time went on, 1999 came along, and as you all know, that was an outstanding year. I don't think it could be any better, and it obviously couldn't be any more dramatic, that's for sure. And we had a wonderful experience, and I loved it. And it wasn't until the final game where I really understood what we were about to do and what had happened in this country leading up to that. So when we beat uh, Brazil in the semifinal and we sold out that Rose Bowl in, I don't know, a few hours right after that, that's when I really was like, wow, this is amazing. Everybody's paying attention to this. Everybody is tuned in. And as a player, you try to focus on the task at hand. And you try not to get too caught up if you can, in everything going on around you. But it's hard. It's hard to stay focused. But that team, we were so tight. We were so together. We were so excited and just having fun doing what we do. And the entire country was having fun following us. You know, we were called the Fun Bus, the, the Girls Next Door, America's Sweethearts and all these amazing things leading up to that final. And now we were like, we gotta win this thing. So we go into this game against China and China had been playing spectacularly. I don't know if, how many of you remember that, but I think they beat Norway like five to nothing in their semifinal. And we had a little bit of a struggle against Brazil. I had one of the best games of my life against Brazil in that semifinal for us. And uh, we squeaked it out to nothing. And I remember going into that final thinking, wow, this is going to be a fantastic game. I'm going to really need to be ready. And we go into that final game, and lo and behold, 0-0 zero, zero through the first uh, you know, regulation time. And then that first overtime happened. And they had a corner kick. And one of the Chinese players played it, and it was flying through the air. I remember this so distinctively. Flying through the air, and I make a diving attempt to save it, and I'm nowhere near it. And I'm thinking, oh shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> Dr. Joe, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and then the ball comes back out again, and I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I scramble to my feet to try to, you know, just in case something comes back at me again, and Brandy bicycle kicks it out to the midfield. And I turn to my left, and there's Christine, Christine Lilly, doing what she does, doing her job, heads it off the line. And at that moment, I'm like, we've got this. We've got this game. If that wasn't going to kill it, ain't nothing going to kill it, right? So sure enough, we go on the penalty kicks, and uh, like, like, the, like my teammates said up there, you know, my job was just to save one, just to save one kick. And um, I did that, so that was, that was awesome. And... Uh, and my teammates had incredible fortitude in knowing what they had to do as well. And that team was just absolutely outstanding in that way. I mean, we knew what our jobs were, and we went ahead and we were able to achieve and, and do them and complete them to the best of our ability. And for the next couple of years, I admit, I, I drank the Kool-Aid a little bit after that 99 World Cup. I, I lost my fitness a little bit, um, 25 pounds. That's more than a little bit. Um, but I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, I need, to, I need to get this changed. I need to do something about this. I need to fix it. And as I was in pursuit of trying to get my fitness back, I lost my spot. And so in 2000, that Olympic Games right after that, I didn't play a single minute of any game. I think we played 41 games that year. Out of 41 games, I played in three 41 games. And that was a very, very humbling experience for me. And as a lot of you know, my career has always been peaks and valleys. There's no in between. I'm either riding high on the, on, on the top of the mountain or I am crashing in, in the bottom. And you know what? That's OK. Because that's really in the bottom is where you figure out what you're made of and figure out who you are and you figure out who your friends are. 
than what you have inside of you. And I did. And I did some, some real soul searching uh, during 2000, 2001. And I decided, you know what? I was a great goalkeeper in 99. All of this that happened to me was self-inflicted. And I am the cause of it. And I will also be the solution for it. And I did, and I worked my butt off in 2001, in 2002, and got my job back. I got my starting spot back, went into 2003 in the World Cup, and unfortunately we lost to Germany, who was definitely a very good team that year. Meanwhile, in my personal life, during 2004, my father began to get really ill. And he had a, a couple of heart attacks, and he was diabetic, and he had his leg amputated below the knee and he was very ill. And during that summer, 2004, we were training for the next Olympic Games, and I would go home in between training camps almost every single time to see my dad, and he was struggling. But boy, did he have a great attitude. Every time he saw me, he was excited. Every time he had that smile on his face, every time that twinkle in his eye, oh, my, my daddy's girl's home, daddy's girl's home. And that's when I met Naomi. Naomi was the massage therapist for the national team at that time, and she became a great person in my life. And Naomi and I got to be really good friends during the summer of 2004. And in, my, in 2004, in August, my father passed away. And that was a devastating blow to me. He died two months before the Olympic Games in June of 2004. And I went into those Olympics having the most powerful feelings of joy and elation to be able to achieve my Olympic dream again on one hand, and the absolute devastation of losing one of my rocks of my life. And to Naomi's credit, she really helped me through all of that. And as we went on, as you know, we won in 2004 again. That was nice. Um, and it was a sweet time in particular because not only because my father had passed away and we had achieved it, but because my mom was able to come. And that Olympic Games would have been the first time ever that neither of my parents would have been attending. And because my father passed away, my mother was able to come and see. And when I saw her, when we were playing Japan in the quarterfinal game, I don't think I could have felt any more stronger of a presence of both of my parents there during that time. And my mom was an absolute rock. She and my dad had been married for 43 years. And I thought for sure that she wasn't going to be able to, to live for much longer after he had passed but she lived for another 11 years after that. And I continued to play on the national team, and in 2004, as you know, we won Olympic gold again, so that was wonderful. And then after that, I decided that I was gonna take a year off and, and reassess and see what I wanted to do with my career. So I stepped away from the game for about a year, and then I came back in 2006, and it didn't go very well for me. I really honestly felt that my game was no longer anointed because my rock, my father, had passed away, and that's how I felt about it. And I didn't play with the great passion and heart that I really thought I should play with, and so then I retired after 2008 Olympics as an alternate. In 2009 and 10, I played with the Washington Freedom in the WPS. Um, and I had a lot of heart and soul and passion for the game, but there was always a little something missing there because of my father passing away. And I continued to try to play, and I played as hard as I could, but there was always a little bit off about it. And in 2009, I suffered a knee injury towards the end of the season, and I was rarely injured. And in 2010, I suffered a debilitating head injury um, in a game against the Philadelphia Independents, and that ended my career on the field. And it began an odyssey of confusion, of isolation, of depression, of disconnection 
from anything and everyone I was. And there was times during those three years after that head injury that I just didn't understand who I was, what I was doing, why I was still hurting, how come I couldn't find a doctor at the time to help me, why I was taking so long, and why, why me? And I remember looking and thinking at my gold medals and looking at pictures of me doing amazing things in soccer and thinking to myself, is that me? Did I really do all those things? Am I ever going to be Brianna Scurry again? And in 2013, I finally got to the right doctor who diagnosed me in 10 minutes and said, I'm going to help you. And that was my doctor, Dr. Crutchfield. And as Naomi said, in 2013, I had this, uh, this operation where I had both occipital nerves dug out of the back of my um, base of my skull. And I felt like myself again. In 2014, I was struggling a little bit, and then someone else came into my life. Her name is Krissa. And she was someone who came in and helped me when I was really having a hard time and trying to figure out who I was and what I was going to become. And she came into my life and she said, you know what, I, I think I can help you. And she did. She helped me rearrange my career. She helped me figure out what I could and couldn't do. She helped me get the medical attention that I needed. I went through another year of therapy. And as the time went on, Krista got to know each other and to be, become really good friends and then become really close and become more than friends. And I am happy to say that in June, on June 2nd of this year, we are going to be married. <laughs> now I have had some amazing parents in my life, the family I was born into. And I've also had an amazing experience and fortune to have the family that I chose. Now Carrie Rifle, who's the person I met at Soccer Plus camp 20 plus years ago, isn't here unfortunately. And I have nicknames for my friends and my family that I've chosen. And they are called angels. Carrie is my first angel. She's not here. Naomi is my second angel. Will you please stand, Naomi? You guys have all met her, but I would like her to stand. Thank you. And Krissa is my third angel. Krissa, will you please stand? Thank you. So when people ask me, Bri, how do you define success? I define success in many ways. You have to have grit. You have to have heart. You have to have resilience. And it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of luck, a Christine Lilly on the left side of your post when you need it, and three angels. Thank you.